Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples rejoined, rejoiced when they saw the Lord, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, I receive the Holy Spirit. If you, for, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when, the, when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and, in, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again at the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and th that though believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, before I say anything <clears throat> further, I just wanted to say that there is something that I'm going to do where normally I might turn my back to you and say something to somebody over there. And but I can't do that because of the microphone situation, which is really quite wonderful, by the way. It's not a complaint. So just telling you, okay? So, <clears throat> well, um, I look around and I see that um, nothing is quite the same as it was uh, last week. I mean, we do have beautiful flowers and we have all kinds of wonderful people here and we have drums and horns um, are not present, but uh, we do have the organ and it plays beautifully and we have people who play it beautifully. And um, our choir is here. And I think that you should know that not every church has a choir on the Sunday after Easter. This is quite an amazing thing. So on behalf of all of us, I am saying thank you, and I come up with a tiny little poetry, and you'll all say afterwards, she's not a poet, is she? <laughs> but that's not the point. Thank you for the music, for each and every song. Sometimes it is the music that keeps us going on. Thank you for the music, for the comfort and the lift. Thank you for your music. Twas a lovely, splendid gift. And another point of, of gratitude is that um, we can note that the empty chair is definitely empty without Father John's presence and guidance, and he is missed. But the pictorial report, as you will note, on Facebook is absolutely priceless, and it assures you that a well-earned sabbatical and precious time with family is well underway. Meanwhile, we strive to keep the gladness of Easter Day in our hearts and minds, and the truth of the resurrection we want to keep lively 
even when an angry world seems to ignore the call to love one another, even when sadness and undesired changes interrupt a well-planned life. As I nibbled on the last chocolate bunny, I wondered, is this my signal to pack up the Easter celebration? Well, in a sense, yes. But the church assures us that we are going to be celebrating for quite some time. The next five more, five Sundays are still Easter time. And after that, we will be celebrating Pentecost when the Holy Spirit uh, is the headliner. So regardless of the season, it seems we humans spend a lot of life in a state of uncertainty. It's been so for centuries. Yes, different worries, varied reasons for despair. It's also been a long span of time between the first proclamation of resurrection and today's buoyant greeting, Christ is risen. We've benefited over that time with the ability to access those gospels and thousands of years of research have occurred. We have long heard the reminder that Jesus was both human and divine, that he loved and ate dinner with sinners, that he was not simply a prophet, but was the Christ, the Son of God. And today, Peter insisted, again, we are to believe this Jesus, God raised up, and of that, all of us are witnesses, all. And in today's epistle, we also heard Peter say, he has given us a new birth into a living hope. Christ is risen indeed. That said, it took less than one day after Jesus died on the cross for the disciples to be at odds. Disciple Tom had Thomas had previously been remembered for a stunning declaration, let us go with Jesus that we may die with him. But now the same Thomas is recipient of disrespect, given a name change, doubting Thomas. And ever since it seems that folks have actually enjoyed defining why we call him doubting Thomas. Perhaps we need to take a look at what really happened, as well as take a look at ourselves. First, Jesus was dead. When Thomas chose to grieve alone, away from his fellow <coughs> disciples who had huddled in a locked room out of fear for the Jews. And that choice to me seems really logical. Some of us prefer privacy in our grief while others are comforting by being together with friends. The fact is, all the disciples grieved, no matter their hiding place. They had not yet been with Mary Magdalene, who, as we know, had already encountered the risen Christ. Isn't it possible that Thomas expected no more or no less proof than did the other disciples? After all, each of these men who loved and followed Jesus were suffering, and each were surely anticipating a terrifying future. As the story goes, we know that the huddled disciples were met by a seemingly unknown visitor, and we know that Jesus ultimately revealed himself as the risen Jesus. And we know that the disciples were ecstatic. And we know that Thomas was absent. Where is Thomas? A disciplined disciple asked. 
Another responded with something akin to this. We all know him. He would not move an inch until he had not only seen, but had touched the Lord. No doubt, Thomas would say, when you're dead, you're dead. So I wonder, would not many of us think the same way? I mean, just because there is an out of the ordinary occurrence, there is no reason to jump to a conclusion. Thomas was a serious guy, as some of us are, not one to imagine things or to be particularly adventurous in his thinking. He needed to see things himself. Again, as so many of us want to do, which is a bit problematic when addressing matters of faith. How, for example, can we be certain the spring will actually come by a specific date? And how does the farmer know exactly when to plant the corn? We don't know, but we go ahead and plan anyway, don't we? And we call it acting in faith. And this is what the Bible means when describing how we walk by faith and not by sight. We even sang that this morning. I think the point is that each disciple, each so wonderfully and uniquely created, every one of them suffered. Each loved his Lord and each would receive the Holy Spirit in his or her own time. So it is with you and me. We humans each have our own way of knowing and believing and doing. And I re repeat Peter's statement, we each have been given new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We simply need to accept it. So this got me to thinking about something that I experienced in an April day in 2006. I was facing the last assignment of my seminary education. Graduation was scheduled. All I needed to do was to complete a rather lengthy assignment. And this was not a time to succumb to exhaustion. There was no opportunity to extend the due date. Simply put, my final project, project was due in two days. The problem? I was really tired. I had no further brilliance to share. <laughs> and while I had loved seminary, I wanted to graduate. That final assignment was required for graduation. Frantic, impatient, I prayed. Well, I actually screamed, God, oh God, help me please. I need something worth to say. A, a miracle would be really helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Hurry, please, amen. Oh, by the way, I really do love you. Which was just about as much of a token gesture as ever I have given. I knew how to pray better than that, but I was frantic. I, I imagine most of us have had those kinds of moments, been there, done that. So I went to the refrigerator, found something to eat and a Coke to drink, noticing on the way that the cat, who usually sat right on top of my computer, was draped over it. He too, perhaps bored, tired. And then I heard a crash. A vase had fallen out of the window. A bit of unexpected wind, I guess. No problem there. I, I like wind, though I am not fond of the destructive winds we've been hearing about in the news. 
I returned to my desk. And I stared a lot. Nothing really was happening. The gentle breeze, though, was beginning a windy, to become a windy night. And I found myself beginning to write. And I wrote almost all night long. And the next day I wrote all the next day. And the wind seemingly was pulling me and pushing me until suddenly the assignment was done. I wrapped my project very carefully because I, was, I knew a storm was coming with all that wind. And as I was approaching where the, do, the uh, professor was, I noticed it was a beautiful sunny day. There was a breeze. And in fact, I, I realized that that breeze was beginning to twirl around my hair. And almost like as if it were laughing at me. And then I laughed because I knew. I delivered the assignment on time, enjoyed a few words with my professor, and returned outside to see for, for myself and the wind was gone. But I knew the spirit had led me and stayed by me. Together we created a resurrection of sorts and all things indeed became new. I was reminded of something I had just read, a piece by a theologian, Matthew Fox, and I'd like to share just some few sentences. Who does not seek resurrection? Who does not seek a full and fuller life? We cannot dwell in despair and anger. We need to rise up and put on life even when the days are dark. Listen to the voice that says, be resurrection, be born again, and again, and again. Rise up and absorb the good news deeply. But do so knowing a new birth is in the offering. And do also remember Resurrection carries both grace and responsibility. So rise up, my friends, and know the spirit who makes all things new. Amen.